Hey everyone, this is Mark Hammonds from Mobile Tuts Plus, and today we're going to be continuing our series in beginning iOS development with Lesson 4, Xcode Fundamentals. So we won't actually be building a new project today. Instead, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to download the source code from my last tutorial, Beginning iOS Development, Building Fortune Crunch. You can either go to the, the other tutorial page and learn how to build this there if you haven't already seen it, or just download the project code directly from this tutorial's post. Now even though we're not going to be building a new project, I am still really excited about this tutorial, and the reason for that is that if I had known a lot of the tips and tricks about optimizing my workflow when I first started developing for the iPhone years ago, I certainly think I could have produced at least another small application um, just with the time savings alone from some of these efficiency tricks. Uh, if nothing else, I definitely would have gotten more sleep at night. <laughs> so hopefully this will do the same for you, and you'll be able to kind of see how you can really get the most out of using Xcode and developing applications for the iOS. So go ahead and open up the project file, whether you get it from this post or from the previous tutorial, and we'll get started. Okay, so this is a good example of your vanilla install of Xcode, how everything's going to look when you first start out. And um, you know it's a lot to take in at first. There are a lot of different window panes, a lot of different buttons. So let's just sort of walk through step by step and deconstruct what you're seeing here. Um, the first and one of the most important things on the screen right now to take note of is the Groups and Files pane on the left. And essentially, this is, you can think of this like Finder for your, your Xcode project. It's going to show you all the different groups and files that you have in your project. It's accompanied by the group tree pane over here, which is going to show you the folders in a group. So if you select classes, I'm sorry, the files in a group. So if you select classes, you'll see the files listed there, um, which is handy if you don't want to expand it. You can also do that for resources, so you can kind of see how that works. Then we have the text editing pane here, which is where you'll actually you know, edit your source code files and do, do your coding for a large part. Um, you can also use that same section to view images. So if you select an image, you can actually get a preview of the image there. And also for, we can get plists and things like that. So this is the uh, property list for our, our project. All right, then at the top we have several different important buttons and, and drop downs here. Uh, this drop down controls the mode that you're in, whether you're using debug or release, what configuration it's called um, that you're currently working with, what your target, what you're going to be building for, simulator or device, uh, the active targets, active executables, things like that. Really, the, the two important things to note here: uh, first, are device and simulator. And this is, like I said, if you're wanting to test out the project you're building on the simulator, you'll select simulator. Um, if you want to test it out on a device, select device and in order to do that, you'll have, you'll have to be a member of the iPhone developer program with a valid provisioning profile. Um, that's where you control that very easily. And then um, you know, the configuration, what this is for is essentially two different ways that Xcode can be configured to compile your code. So the debug configuration is what you're going to use when you're testing your application, you're in the development process, and it's optimized for that. Then the release configuration is optimized for actually you know, distributing through iTunes, um, to your end users, and it's going to do a lot of things to optimize the speed of your application. So that's why you would select that particular configuration. And then another important thing, the third, I guess, third important thing about this menu to note is the active executable. So by default, iPad is is selected, and I actually find that kind of annoying because I do most of my work for iPhone. Um, but you can either select iPad or iPhone from this particular drop down, and that will determine. What, which simulator opens when you build and run or build and debug your project. So we're going to go ahead and switch that to iPhone. All right, then we have this action dropdown, which you can use for a lot of different things. I won't go into everything that it can do, but um, one of the most important things is, is maybe the add new file here or reveal in Finder for whatever you have selected to, in the groups and files pane. It's just a lot, sort of a shortcut for, for handy different uh, different features. The breakpoints button is used to activate or deactivate breakpoints in your code. And um, I'm not sure, we probably won't be able to get into that today. We'll probably do a separate session just purely on debugging and on um, you know, working with the debugger and whatnot. But 
if you do already know about breakpoints, you may not have noted that you can actually turn them all off or on here and that enabling them will automatically switch you into build and debug mode rather than build and run mode. And then you have the build and run button or breakpoints are on, build and debug button. And uh, essentially build and run is going to build your executable and then run it with the active you know, configuration, everything like that. Um, whereas build and debug is going to do the same thing, only it's going to have the debugger running so that you can do things like use breakpoints and use GDB and things like that. So um, I actually normally keep it, during the development process, I normally keep this on build and debug and not build and run. And you can also activate either of those by just going up here, build, build and run, or build, build and debug. Uh, the stop button here is useful when you actually are running your code. Uh, you, can, you can stop your application just by tapping that button. And then the info button here at the top, get info. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do with that, but the one I'm going to talk about is selecting your project up at the top here in the Groups and Files pane, and then going to info to get more information about your project. And as you can see, there are a lot of different options that come up when you do that. You have general project settings that you can configure, such as organization name down at the bottom here. Um, you have build settings. You can see right now it has all configurations selected, but you know what SDK you're going to be using for this project is a very common setting you might need to modify or, or work with. Um, this is also where you'll set your code signing uh, information if you need to, code signing identity, and your target operating system. So what it is, which operating system you're building for. You can see that iOS deployment target. So deployment target of 4.2 um, if you only want it to run on 4.2 devices. But uh, you know, a lot of the things that I write, I end up actually targeting 3.0 and making it compatible all the way through 4.2. So that's a common one that I select. And then you have configurations, which is you know, debug and release. Um, you can actually create your own configurations here as well. And comments, just general comments. So these are all very, very, very handy um, tabs and things that you will need to know about at some point in your iPhone development career if you continue on. So definitely keep that in mind. And that pretty much covers all the basics here of, of the, the interface. Um, the only other thing that I want to go over is you know, note that these panes aren't by any means fixed in stone. So you know, I personally rarely ever use this group um, group tree view. I just don't find it very helpful to my development workflow. So you know, you can actually just click here on on um, on the window pane and drag it up to completely fill the screen with either your image previews or mostly in my case, the, uh, the actual code that you're editing. And you can do the same to the left as well. So you can actually just drag this if you don't want to see the groups and files. And now you just purely have the, the source code files that you're working on, which can be handy. And I'll show you in my developer configuration setup uh, how that's, in fact, very useful for me. But for now, let's transition into talking more about the groups and files pane. And you know, sort of what all you can expect to find over there. So obviously, as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of like Finder for your Xcode project, but there is at least one really big difference that you need to be aware of, and that's that groups, for the most part, are logical. They aren't a direct correlation to your file system. So what I mean by that is, you know, in, a, in Finder, if you see a folder that says other sources, that's actually a folder on the file system. Um, and it contains its own you know, set of files that are within it. However, in the Groups and Files pane, it's, it could be that that folder is just purely, and most of the time it is, just purely for logical purposes. It's not actually a folder that exists on your file system. So to demonstrate this, if I come down to Resources, and I right-click and go to Reveal and Finder, you'll see that these image resources are right along next to main.m and fortune crunch prefix.pch, even though main.m and fortune crunch prefix are actually listed under the other sources group. So that's an important fact to, to be aware of. Um, it'll, it'll be more relevant to you probably as you're going along and you need to look at something in Finder or you know, maybe you're doing SVN check-ins or whatnot and trying to figure out where your folders are. 
Um, just be aware of that. And then the reason why I say it's mostly not a, cor a direct correlation is because, as you can also see in Finder here, we actually do have a classes folder, and we do have the corresponds to this classes um, group. So you can set up you can set that up in your configuration of Rexcode to actually map to a real folder for one of your groups, and that's what's done with the classes folder. So if you open that, you'll see the files that are listed underneath classes to the left here. So like I said, I mean it's it's not um, earth shattering by any means, but it's important to be aware of that particular fact. Um, now let's kind of step through the folders that you see here. Classes generally used as it as you would think to hold the classes for your application, your custom app delegate, your view controllers, um, other source code files that you're you're developing for your app. Um, resources is actually normally used to hold all of your external media. So if you have a bunch of audio clips or video clips or images, all those types of things that you're going to be importing into your project, you want to put them into your resources folder. And you'll note that zip files are by default included down here as well. I'm actually going to split on that personally. I do see the value in, in placing them there, but occasionally I've seen people do things like include, uh, and I actually do keep them in resources, but occasionally, like I said, I've seen people put these up into the classes folder. So they put it underneath the class that it corresponds with, so you have all three files in a row. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, I'm not aware of any reason why you shouldn't do that. I'm not sure that it will hurt anything. It probably probably won't hurt anything necessarily unless you're um, working with, uh, with, with the file path within your code and you, you happen to forget that you need to go into the classes folder to get that zip file. Um, but by default, they're included in resources, so that's what I would recommend you do as well. Uh, you'll note that this also has plist files, so fortune crunch info.plist is here as well. And um, yeah, another another thing to, to sort of be aware of here is that when you're actually copying in files into your project, and the easiest way to do that is just to drag them directly into the resources folder. Um, when you're doing this, something that you see all over the place in tutorials online and certainly in a lot of the things that I write is a warning about this dialog box. So it seems like you can't go anywhere without seeing some block of text in a tutorial saying, you know, be sure to click the copy items into destination groups folder um, checkbox. And that's, that's this right here. And the reason why that's important is because if you don't select that, then it's actually, the next code isn't going to actually make a copy of the file and place it into your project. It's just going to add a reference in your project to that file on your local file system. Um, so, you know, in this case, if I if I copy this file in and I didn't say copy into destination groups folder, as is you know, it's unchecked there by default in this case, um, then when I went to build and run my ap application on a device, obviously my desktop is not going to be on my device. So I'm going to have you know I'm going to have a blank image that, that's not showing up in my application. This actually happened to me. Uh, back when the SDK was at 2.0, and I was working on a project, trying to get it out really quickly, and ran into this bug where you know, all of a sudden my button images weren't appearing, and I couldn't figure out why, and it was because, for whatever reason, for those couple images, I hadn't selected this box. So it actually is really important, and being aware of it, even if it is repetitive in a lot of tutorials and whatnot, is uh, is an important step of you know, just getting comfortable with, uh, with the Xcode setup and saving yourself trouble down the line. So in this case, we are going to click, I'm going to go ahead and click uh, copy item into destination groups and hit, hit add. You can see now that we've added this um, at 2x version of the icon. And it's as easy as that to add in resources into your project. It's the same with anything else in your I could have easily dragged that into any other group that you see here. Um, yeah, just a quick aside, the reason why you see at 2x and this, and the reason why I, I put that in there and use this as an example is because that's all you have to do to make images compatible with, um, with, with the iPhone Retina display. So by default, with a regular iPhone, iPhone 3G, 3GS, uh, if, I, if I say to use icon.png in my source code file, then this is exactly what's going to be called. But if my source code is running on an iPhone 4 with a Retina display, then it's actually going to look and see, is there a version of this file with at 2x in the file name before the file name extension? And if there is, it's going to use that image instead of just the icon.png file. 
and so you know if you you size up your images and make them look pretty at double resolution, um, you can really quickly just prepend that into the or add that into the file name and then add it into your project and you're basically done. So it's kind of just a helpful helpful side tip, not related to Xcode necessarily, but I guess important to to be aware of. Um, yeah. So now to show you, let's let's actually do one more thing. I'll go to action. Uh, reveal in Finder. Now, if you actually, if you, if at, at some point you end up deleting some of the images or resources that you have in your project from Finder, and not from Xcode, you're going to notice. Well, sometimes you get a warning if you have it open at the time it happens, but if not, you're going to open your project one day and say, "Oh, why is this, you know, file name red?" And the reason is because red means doesn't exist. So, right now, this file does not exist on or can't be found. Um, on your file system, so it turns to uh, to red text there. I'll just go ahead and delete that now. All right, so that's the resources folder. Frameworks folder is used for you know storing or the references to all the different frameworks you're going to be using in your project. Uh, you can add new frameworks by right clicking here, going to add existing frameworks. You can also drag in static libraries directly into into this folder. Um, yeah, it's pretty simple. Products is what you're actually building, so Fortune Crunch app in this case. And you'll note that it's red because since we just downloaded this file, this project from the internet, we haven't actually built it yet, so there is no binary, so it's saying, hey, it does not exist or can't be found. And that leaves the only folder left to talk about is other sources, um, or group, rather, I should say. So other sources, it, by default, it just holds this prefix file and main.m. And as I believe I mentioned in a previous tutorial, main.m is actually the first function that's called when your application runs. So that's definitely a very important file to be aware of. And you know, there may be occasionally times, probably pretty rare, I'd say very rare, that you may need to modify this file. But um, yeah, or at least look at it. But uh, you know, it's quite rare that will happen. But it's there for you if you need it. And then um, the PCH file is a prefix file. So you can see here that uh, we're going to import foundation.h and uikit.h, and basically by putting it in here, we're going to guarantee that those those frameworks are included in all of our or imported in all of our files, regardless of whether we've manually typed it in or not. It's just sort of prepending it to the the beginning. So you can think of it in that way. So you could even add in. You could obviously you could add this, edit this, and add in your own frameworks to be included by default with everything as well. Okay, that pretty much covers the groups and files pane, at least everything I want to talk about for now. Um, so to move on, let's go ahead and start talking about you know, some other just basic things you can do to, to make your life easier, really. And one of the first of those that I found is if you go to View, Layout, Show Favorites Bar, this is actually going to put sort of like a, a book smart, a bookmarks type of bar from, from the web browsing world into your Xcode project. So now, if I know that you know 95% of the time in this particular application, I'm really only going to be using two files, I can put them right up here as favorites, and then I just have to click on their listing here to jump straight to that particular file. Um, you can also do this with resources. So if I wanted to add in the Fortune Crunch zip file up here, I can do that as well. And that's just going to launch. If I click that, it's going to launch straight into Interface Builder. I actually have to double click it, sorry. Yeah, so that's that's really handy, especially for the setup that I personally use when, um, when working in Xcode. Um, yeah, so that really just leaves the only other thing I want to show you that's sort of general uh, Xcode related content is if you press Command Shift F, you'll get this really handy project find um, search box. So if you just want, you know, you know that a file exists or a line of code exists or you know an object declaration exists somewhere in your project, you can do Command Shift F. F and then search for whatever it is. So we could search for, say, you know, Fortune Crunch and get a list of 
all the different instances of that in the application. And you can also do a find and replace if you're looking to do that. Um, it's not the same as refactoring. There's actually a refactoring tool we'll talk about later as well, but that's uh, that's handy. And then note that there's a drop-down list here where you can actually search in project or in frameworks or in all open file or open projects or in all open files. So you can actually search across projects if you have like three different ones open. Um, it's really handy, and I use this all the time. Uh, only other really th important thing to note here is this ignore case button. So if you'd want it to be case sensitive or not, that's where you set that toggle that option. All right, so now let's transition over into what you'll be doing most of the time in Xcode, which is actually editing your source code files. So I'm sure a lot of you come from uh, different development backgrounds, and if you haven't been doing Mac development already, specifically, or iPhone development already, then the text editor in, um, in Xcode is going to be completely foreign to you. And it's, you know, at first might be a little bit frustrating until you get to, to understand, you know, how to do things quickly, and then it, it can become quite formidable and definitely something to make your, your development process more efficient. So to start off, uh, the vanilla install just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I don't like this install at all. I, I don't like this setup personally at all for my, my coding needs, and it starts with um, the fact that we have no line numbers over here. Uh, oops, just out of the breakpoint. Um, yeah, but we have no line numbers on the side in the gutter here, which is pretty big for me. I mean, especially if you're working on a project with someone else, you guys might reference, you know, oh, it's on, you know, line 342. Just make, make your change there. We don't have line numbers. That doesn't help you much. Um, it also doesn't, um, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't like the, the bright white display there. So I'm just going to configure this the way that I would if I were actually developing an application with Xcode right now. So. Come up to Xcode, go to Preferences. The very first thing I'm going to do is come over to um, Fonts and Colors. And you can see here, this is the Xcode default. Um, fortunately, Xcode includes a lot of other templates just by def or just as part of, the, part of the ship. So you can see here, Dusk. Much better. <laughs> That's actually what I use most of the time. But there's some other cool options as well, such as Midnight. I also like that one. Presentation is good if you're giving a presentation somewhere, it'll automatically zoom it in for you, which is nice. Bear, if you want even more simplistic, minimalistic. Sunset's kind of cool too. And uh, Spartan. Spartan's kind of neat also. Um, so I'm going to go to Dusk, because that's actually what I use most of the time. And obviously, you know, you can set, as you can see here, you can set all these different settings individually as well. You don't have to use one of the templates. But if we come over to text editing, see show show gutter is where I was, the gutter is what I was talking about. It's this section right here. So you actually take that out if you wanted to. But I want to keep it, and I actually want to add into it line numbers. All right. So if I hit OK, now I have line numbers. I know. Um, I know what line I'm working on, what line to reference to someone else if they're helping me out. And um, yeah, that's, that's that's very handy. So the next thing I would do is I would actually remove the groups and files pane. I don't really find that very useful either. <laughs> and the reason why I don't find it very useful is because there's a, a really handy shortcut that a lot of people, I think, enjoy, and that's Command-Shift-D. And Command-Shift-D will actually let you open files or search for files um, very quickly, so it's it's actually called open op, open quickly is the uh, the feature name. So if I just start typing in fortune, you can see that it already has dropped down all the different files in the project that match for. So say I want to go to fortune crunch, app delegate, bam, there I am. So that to me, um, I'm sorry that I did the project find. Um, that to me, doing command shift D is actually a lot faster than having to take my hands off the keyboard, over to the mouse, over to Groups and Files pane, selecting the file, um, you know, expanding or, or contracting folder lists, that type of thing. So, you know, it's just totally personal preference, but it's good to know that that option exists. And of course, as I think I mentioned earlier, you can always slide that back out if you do need it for whatever reason. Um, just something to be aware of. So this is pretty much how I would have my display. 
Now there is one big difference, and that's that I normally work with a 26 inch widescreen monitor. So uh, what I actually like to do is have multiple windows open for the code editor. And the way you do that is this little button up here in the right, this, this, this um, <laughs> I had gone completely unnoticed for me for a very long time. Um, and I'm very glad I, I did eventually find out about it. But if you click this, you actually get multiple windows opening up. And if you click the, the button that appears after that, you can make those disappear. So this is a pretty cool feature if you wanted to have, you know, say three different files open at the same time in your text editor. And the way that I tend to use it though is I actually, since, as I mentioned, since I have a widescreen display, I don't want to stack horizontally. I actually want to stack, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to stack vertically. I want to stack horizontally. And so you can do that as well by selecting option and then pressing that button. So if you have option selected when you press it, it's going to split it into horizontal panes. And um, actually, what what that when I when I'm on my main display, what this actually ends up looking like is uh, something like uh, let's see. Oh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> ends up looking about like this. So this is basically what I'm looking at most of the time, only you know, on a larger screen. And the reason I like this particular setup is that I can have. One second. Okay, yeah, so I can have my primary code window open over here. This is where I'm going to be spending most of my time on this particular um, project or on this particular file. And then I might have like the header for it over here or something like that. Um, and then I have you know other files that I know I'm going to need, but just occasionally over here. And because it's on a wider display, it's really easy just to switch from one window to the next, and I don't have to spend time um, you know toggling between different files uh, as much. Definitely it's going to happen for everybody anyways, but as much being the key point there. So for now though, I'm just going to remove all of these. It's just a cool feature I wanted you to know about. Alright. Okay, I also just noticed that I have the Soho Notes tab here, so I'm going to pause for a second and just sort of remove that. That might be annoying some of you. Okay, Soho Notes is a great application, but don't need to see the tab on the screen. Um, now, that's, now that's taken care of. Uh, let's move on to, okay, so I've shown you my setup here and you can see, you know, obviously for me, why the, the favorites bar is so important. Um, one other thing I want to note actually is that uh, if you do want to open multiple windows with your source code files, you can do that. So if you double click here, you'll actually get a new window completely just with the text in it. And so that's that's handy to know too. Um, you know, I, like I, I mentioned earlier, I prefer to pop them out like that rather than the new ones, but you know, there are definitely times where that's useful. All right, so having shown you my setup, let's move on to actually you know, tips and tricks with the text editor itself and how to get the most out of using it. So well, I guess the first thing to be aware of is right now you'll notice that I'm in fortune crunch app delegate.m. There's a really cool, quick way to switch to, um, to the, the main header file, and that's just to do option, command, and then the up arrow. So now I'm in .h, now I'm in .n, .h, .n. So that's a handy shortcut to know and a quick way to switch between files. Um, definitely something that will probably help you out over time if you get used to using it. Um, next thing, I guess, let's talk more about just the actual um, the features of the text editor itself. Um, you know, one of the main things I guess to point out is that in in Xcode you have what's called code folding. So if I come over to the sidebar here, you can actually see it's going to select the code in this block for me visually, and then I can actually fold this code, which means to close that block visually as well. So the code's still there, and it's going to compile fine if I were to choose to do that, but visually now, I don't have to look at it. <laughs> And that's actually quite handy when you want to get a, a, gra a, a grip on you know, the overall file structure of an application, or I'm sorry, not file structure, the overall um, structure of a source file. And you know, there's one function that's just massive in there. So you use code folding to close that function, and you can see everything else in context and jump more quickly between um, what's available for you on the screen. So that's definitely a useful tip. But there are actually some things you can do to make this even more seamless with code, fo code folding. So if you were to press Command, Control, and then the up arrow. You'll actually fold all of the blocks of code in, in your all the functions 
uh, methods rather, in your file. So command control up will fold them, and then you can do command control down, and now everything's unfolded. So that's kind of a, a handy tip too, because you might be in the middle of something and you're trying to think, okay, what else do I have? What other methods am I working with here? Just use that hotkey, you can see them all really quickly, then you, you know, expand them all again and keep, keep working as usual. Uh, another cool thing you can do is if you're in one of those really large functions, um, like self road index path, for instance, and you want to collapse just the function or the method that you're in, you can do control, command, and then the left arrow, and that's just going to collapse the current, um, the current method that you're working with. And then command, control, right arrow, We'll expand it again for you there. So again, just a little tip, help you out over time. Okay, so the next tip I want to tell you about is actually one of the main reasons um, why I initially, when I first started using Xcode, decided to stick with the built-in text editor. And there are a lot of reasons to do that, but this is what really made it stand out to me. Um, and that's auto-completion. So you can see here that we have these two lines, self.window. Say I, I was writing this by hand, and I didn't have those lines in front of me. Um, if I don't remember exactly what I need to do, I can just start to type what I think I need to do, and then Xcode is going to autofill in an option for me. Maybe I do want to add subview, which is the first pick it shows, or maybe I don't, and maybe I want to do something else. And so I, hit, I can hit escape, and escape will show me what options I have from here. So obviously, you know, AD, means add subview, add observer, add gesture recognizer. If we go back, we can see, okay, now we have everything that starts with A that I can do from here, what messages I can pass to self.window. And now one more step back, and I can actually see every message that I can possibly pass that Xcode knows about to um, self.window. So this is really, really handy. And um, you know, if you are using it a lot, maybe another good example might be array. So say I was creating an NS array. Okay, so I, I've started to type NS array, and it's auto-completed that version for me. If at this point, rather than continuing to type, I hit tab, I'm going to select that. Tab. And it with, in this case, I don't want array, I want objects, so tab then hit tab again, and now I'm going to fill in the, the uh, parameter there. So, you know, one, two, up, three, and then nil. So what's really cool about auto-completion is that you don't have to remember as much by just, you know, pure memorization, um, or you don't have to switch back to the docs as much to look up exactly what that method is called. And that alone, if you use it, will save you a ton of time in the long run. So definitely be aware of autocomplete, be aware of hitting escape to see all the different options available to you, and be aware of hitting tab to autofill in words. I mean, if you just make, take that one tip alone out of this entire talk, um, and when you're filling out names and, that are autocompleted for you, hit tab instead. I mean, those, those little efficiencies add up over time. So you'll gain a lot of time in the long run uh, just by using that one particular tip. Right, now actually, you saw something else happen there. Um, when I completed this line, the, the the brackets, the matching brackets lit up. So um, you can actually force that to happen as well. If you go to the end of a bracket or a closing bracket or brace and you just simply hit the right arrow um, from the left of it to pass over it, it'll highlight the corresponding bracket or brace. So that's handy for when you have deeply nested um, message passing going on, kind of like we have here, but even more so especially. Um, and it's also useful for doing, you know, conditional statements. I've gotten out of control and you're like, oh, where do I have a match for this or not? You can just kind of cursor over that or use the arrow key to go over that and see what that particular um, race is going to match against, correspond with. So that's handy to know. Um, similarly, just remove this first. But another thing you can do is you can come to a come to a brace or a bracket for that matter, and you can double click it, and it'll select everything in between. So if I double click here, I have the entire contents of that method selected. 
that's a pretty useful feature in some cases. I mean, it's, it's definitely nice to know about. Okay, so now let's talk about pragma marks. You see these in the source code file itself. Pragma mark here and uh, down at the bottom as well. And if you've been you know, just sort of dabbling with Xcode development so far, um, you're probably wondering exactly what that does. So if you didn't already know, putting in pragma marks in your code will actually create these nicely categorized dropdowns of the entire source code file. So you can see this says pragma mark application lifecycle cycle, which is, is displayed here. The other one says memory management. And the dash actually creates a horizontal rule uh, between groups. So you put in pragma mark dash to get this to show up, and then pragma mark whatever your text is to sort of categorize your uh, project source code file into a very logical structure. And this goes so far in taking those thousands of lines, uh, files, and um, you know making them more manageable. <laughs> it's definitely a useful tip to be aware of and something that you should always do with every project, regardless of the file size or the line numbers, um, to just make it easier to maintain and manage by whoever comes after you as well as yourself. So definitely be aware of that. You can put any type of text in there that you want, use any type of the structure that you want to order things with, it's completely up to you. Uh, and a cool thing to note though is that you don't have to stick to this particular uh, formatting style. There are other options available as well. So one that I've seen people do is um, you can actually say, fix me, remember to add additional subviews. And then when you look at the drop down, you'll actually see, you know, fix me. And this is going to stick out to someone a lot more later on than just the comment in itself. It's kind of a handy convention you can you can do to put in notes to yourself for aspects of your code that you want to be sure and change before you deploy this, this particular project. Okay, so the next two tips I'm going to tell you about have been infinitely valuable to me, and I use them just about every day in my normal development workflow. Um, if you see an object that you want to get more information on, something that you want to read more about in the documentation, um, or a method call for that matter, you can actually select it and then do, com I'm sorry, command, option, double click, and that will automatically open the developer documentation for what you selected. So you can see here I have UI application, which is what I selected there, and now I'm reading about um, the UI application class. And that's that's just really really handy for you know when you, you you're just starting out to work with a particular class and you need to get more information on it or you see a class you haven't used before in someone else's code. Um, like I said, I use that literally all the time, um, and it works for methods as well. So if I double clicked here, I did command, option, double click, make key invisible. So now I'm reading about this particular method, and it's just that quick. So. Definitely start using that if you aren't already. And similar to that particular function, you can actually, um, let me see if I can find a good example here. Um, yeah, okay, here's a great one, yes. So I wanna know what yes is. I don't know, that means nothing to me. I don't wanna read about it in the documentation. I wanna actually see how yes is declared. You can do that by holding command and then just double clicking on the symbol. And now I'm looking at how yes is actually declared. And you can see that it's defined um, to ju just be one. And no is defined to just be zero. So that's really cool. I mean, this is, to me, another very useful thing that I do all the time when I'm looking at, um, you know, how does something actually function? Um, you know, for instance, IB action. I want to see what IB action actually is. I can do command, double click. And I can see the IB action is literally defined as void. So that's, again, just very, very helpful. Um, and it works with other things too, like you know, I want to see Fortune Crunch View. I'm in the app delegate right now. I want to see the view controller. Command, double click. Now I'm in the implementation of the view controller. So really, really cool feature and definitely something that could help you out a whole lot over time as you um, you're, are digging into other people's code and even your own. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about with regard to text editing or source code editing in Xcode are the hotkeys you can use to increase your productivity. 
Um, there are many, many different key combinations that will really help you out um, over the long term if you take the time to learn them. Uh, I don't have time to show you what they all are at this particular moment. If you'd like to see a tutorial just on you know, being productive with, uh, with these hotkeys in Xcode, leave a comment and I'll, I'll take note of that and try to get it into the content schedule later on. But for now, what I do want to point out is that if you come up to Xcode and go to Preferences and go over to Key Bindings, um, you can see you have menu key bindings and then text key bindings, and these are what I was specifically talking about. And uh, you can actually see all the different key bindings that you can use here to do things more quickly while you're writing your source code files. Uh, there's also a really great chart available for this online. So if you go to your favorite web browser and you search for um, Coco Samurai Xcode Keyboard Shortcuts, you should find this particular chart. And there are a lot of other ones out there too. This is the one I like the most. Um, but it's literally just a really large um, chart that you can even print out and put on your wall or something like that. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend doing that, but you know, it might be kind of cool. Um, regardless, it's just a, a, a nicely formatted way of looking at all the different key bindings that are available um, for Xcode when you're, when you're editing source code files. So you can check that out if you'd like. I will say that learning those shortcuts, however you choose to do it, uh, can be a huge time saver. So, you know, again, I just want to drill home that point and, and say that please, if you're going to be serious about you know, iPhone development and programming, you know, it's really worth your while to, to take the time to learn those shortcuts. Um, okay, so now that I've praised the benefits of Xcode, I actually want to take a slightly different direction. And for those of you who are you know, TextMate pros and don't want to use the editor built into Xcode, I'm going to show you how to do that. So start by going to Xcode Preferences, and then come over to File Types. And from the File Types uh, window, you want to scroll down until you can find uh, underneath the text, you'll find Source Code. So what you want to do is you want to set the source code to use an external editor. You can select anything that's installed on your system at the time. I prefer Text Wrangler for a lot of uh, things, but uh, you can use TextMate as well or Emacs or whatever. So you know, that's where you would set it. And after you applied that setting, then if you were to double click on a file or open it any other way, the next code should use the external editor rather than the built-in editor uh, in order to allow you to edit that source code file. So yes, I just told you how to do that, but now I'm going to give a caveat. And the caveat is, you know, if you're coming from a web development background and you, know, you, you hear this news and you're like, oh great, I can use what I've always been using, I actually want to tell you to not. I want to tell you to, to first take a week, use the built-in editor with Xcode, and try to really learn all the hotkeys and the shortcuts and, and whatnot that are available to you. And if after that first week or two, you're still not happy with it, you don't really like the built-in editor, and you prefer, you truly do just prefer your own external editor, then sure, like from there on, use that. But don't just, you know, stick with it because it's all you know or because it's what you've always been doing. Um, definitely give the one or next code a shot first and make a, a, um, an informed decision on which editor works best for you. Okay, so there's still a lot of things to talk about with regard to, um, with regard to Xcode. But for this particular tutorial, I just want to talk about two more things. And the first is when you go to build and run a project, so check your drop down here, make sure it's set to simulator, debug, iPhone simulator. When we're doing this, you, you'll, you are able to send messages to the console with NS log. Um, so in the Fortune Crunch example, if you click this, we actually not only change the cookie, but we also sent this NS log message in Crunch Cookie. Um, the important thing to note is how to actually view those later. And you can do it either by doing in Xcode Shift Command R. This will bring up the, the debugger and the, the console log. Um, you can see this is the text we sent out with NS log. Uh, or just by clicking this GDB icon in Xcode as well. 
and also show the console. So you know, that's really important to be aware of, and uh, you'll see all kinds of things here besides, you'll see debugging output here as well, and, and besides just your own NS log statements. So this is definitely a good thing to check when you're running an application. You might see warnings about um, memory not being uh, auto-released correctly and things like that. So definitely keep your eye open on, on this particular window when you're running your projects. All right, so the last thing I'm going to point out in this tutorial is how to switch from the standard iPhone simulator to another one. So you can see here right now we're on just the standard 3G, uh, 3GS simulator, and we want to switch go by going to hardware with the simulator open, device to the iPhone Retina display version. All right, we're going to have to actually relaunch after setting that. And you can see now this is you know more of how your application is going to look on the uh, Retina display. Okay, so this has been a crash course into using Xcode and getting familiar with all the different functionality and features that it has to offer. There's actually a ton more that we could talk about, um, many more things you can do to optimize your development efforts. And one of the big things that we haven't talked about yet is actually debugging your applications. So we'll do a future tutorial on that in this series on just dedicated purely to debugging and how to use the debugger. Um, and I'll also think about launching individual tutorials on other useful tips and tricks with Xcode. So if that's something that interests you, please do leave a comment. Um, I do definitely read all of those and, and want to know if that's you know, worth taking the time to, to publish or not. So you know, if it's something that interests the community, then it's something I'll try to get in to our content lineup. All right, so thanks for watching this video, and I will see you next time.